Well, thank you all so much for being here today. This is very exciting. I'm Melissa Rosenberg. If I didn't get to meet you, I am the executive director of the Harvard County Autism Society. Um, you are in today the nonprofit collaborative of Howard County. I always like to give a shout out. This is our home for five years with 15 other nonprofits and anchored by the Housing Commission and CoWorks. It's an incredible partnership of Howard County and the Association of Community Services. So just a really great space. Um, this year we're celebrating 30 years, very exciting, uh, with services to autistic individuals throughout the lifespan. Uh, we even have seniors that we're serving now. Families and the community. Um, we're gonna be expanding later this summer into Anne Arundel County and Montgomery County. We're really excited about that. We'll be in unveiling a new name um, early fall, so please look out for that. Um, we're really excited. We've been growing for a long time and it's, it's nice to, to make it official. Um, so, I want to uh, welcome our honored guest. This is such a thrill. And we've been, we've been working on this at least since March. <laughs> so it's incredible that it's come together. So our honored guests, Senator Ben Cardin, Senator Crispian Holland, and Congressman Sorbanes, they've joined us today for this important discussion and um, to acknowledge our, our grant award. So I'm gonna turn it over to all of you to just give us some opening remarks. And we'll start with Senator Cardin. Well, uh, Melissa, first of all, thank you very much. Thank you for what you do for the autism community. Thank you for what you do for our community. Uh, we thank we know the leadership here we're very much part of your team so uh, thank you for having uh, senator van holland and congressman sarbanes and myself we work together as a team president rigby it's nice to have you here from the county council we work very closely with our county partners and secretary Bate. nice to have you here the the, the more administration has really focused on providing leaving no one behind uh, that's been the motto uh, that i think we see in today's society so I want to put this in context, if I might. Under President Biden, we've seen an effort to reinvest in America. And when you look at the legislation that he was able to get through the Congress of the United States, from the bipartisan infrastructure bill that dealt with our core infrastructure in this country, including broadband as well as transportation. And also, by the way, Chesapeake Bay was included in that. Uh, when, when you take a look at the safest communities where we're investing in uh, behavioral health services in our schools and, and dealing with the challenges that we have with gun safety, uh, when, when you take a look at the American Rescue Plan that dealt with our health care infrastructure to get through the COVID-19, when you look at the Inflation Reduction Act, which was investment in climate change, and the list goes on and on and on that President Biden was able to set up a network that we can make really once in a generation opportunity to fill the gaps that we have in our community. But there is a major ingredient in every one of President Biden's efforts, and that was equity and justice. Recognizing that there have been many communities that have been left behind in the past, and there's great need that has not been met in vulnerable populations. And every one of his programs is focused in that direction. I am very proud of the Maryland congressional delegation. I'm very proud of what we've been able to do to follow in that leadership, to use our power to fill the voids in our community and to expand services that the, the, for those who need it the most. So our federal delegation does something that's a little bit different than other delegations. We talk with each other. We work together. As a result, we can deliver more resources to our community. And the three of us share the same vision for our community to help those that are really in need. And as a result, we've been all over our state announcing multiple grants. Yesterday, Senator Van Hollen and I were in Prince George's County, where we were dealing with the arc of Prince George's County and, and Melwood, and dealing with a, a corridor uh, of a transit that's been underdeveloped for a long period of time, where we used our influence in order to get resources in that part of the state. So we're here in Howard County, not just because of what you do in Howard County, because we know your reach is beyond Howard County. We recognize that. But we're here to be your partner. We're here as we have some really good news, as you know. We used our discretion collectively 
for $440,000, nice amount of money, uh, <laughs> in order that you can expand your reach to provide information, services, and advocacy on behalf of the autism and its community. So it really is a pleasure for us to be here today. We look forward to the discussion, but we won't leave without presenting you a little gift. With that, let me turn it over to the person who writes the checks, <laughs> the member of the Appropriations Committee, and really is our strategist on how we handle the appropriation process in the United States Senate, Senator Chris Van Well, thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Ben. Uh, thank you, Senator Cardin, for leading uh, Team Maryland uh, in the United States Congress, and it's uh, wonderful to be here also with our our friend and colleague, uh, John Sarbanes, and thank all of you. Uh, Melissa, thank you in the Autism Society of Howard County, which also now is working in Montgomery County and Anne Arundel County. And soon, I think we all hope, will be statewide. Uh, but I, I do want to uh, thank, thank you and everybody around this table, uh, the Autism Society family, as well as everybody else gathered here. Uh, to talk about these really important issues, to make sure that we have a community, a society, a state, and a country that is inclusive, uh, and make sure that everybody uh, has a chance uh, to participate with dignity and to empower uh, individuals. And that's what um, you are all about here. Um, I really see this hiring uh, program as a really important step, as, you, as all of you around this table know. Uh, when it comes to addressing issues of people with disabilities or people with different abilities, um, whoever it may be, we've made, I think, substantial progress in many areas, but one of the areas we continue to lag in uh, is in terms of employment. Uh, so I really do see this as a win-win-win, um, providing skill, skill building opportunities uh, to individuals with autism uh, who can offer so much to employers um, in, in, in many ways. Of course, they think differently, but in many ways that also can help uh, an employer if, and this is the second win, if the employer understands uh, how to best utilize um, and employ uh, that individual. So obviously the employer piece is important. I want to thank all the employers uh, who are part of this and I know part of the efforts to expand. And of course, when you put those two wins together, you get another big win, which is uh, a much more inclusive uh, society and economy, with, which we all benefit from. So I want to thank all of you. Um, I, I want to thank you, uh, Madam Secretary, for all the work you're doing um, at the state level. It is great to partner with you. Um, and, and thank you as well to Christine uh, Rigby and your team, um, Howard County uh, Council. Um, and to all of you around the table. And finally, I do just want to close by emphasizing a point that uh, Senator Cardin made. Um, we, we do look at a lot of applications, and so does the committee staff on the Appropriations Committee. Uh, they vet them very carefully. Um, and so the fact that this was one of, the, one of them that rose to the top um, is really a sign of the good work that all of you did in putting the work here together. Um, and John Sarbanes has been an amazing uh, champion um, for his entire congressional district, but really more broadly for the, the state and the country when it comes to this fundamental issue of fairness and equity and equality. Um, and I want to thank him for all his work on that. And, uh, and Ben Cardin, let me just say in closing uh, that uh, Senator Cardin announced he's not running for re-election. Uh, he is running hard through the finish line. He has been an amazing champion uh, for so many issues uh, in our state, our country, and really around the world. Uh, and so we're really pleased to have him uh, leading uh, Team Maryland and to have all of you participate uh, in this process so that we can expand the circle of opportunity inclusion uh, to everybody. So thank you all very much. And with that, let me turn it over to John Sarbanes. Thank you, Senator Van Hollen. Let me just say that the senators, both senators, commitment to this, uh, certainly Senator Cardin, when you look at his entire career, is a value-based commitment. It makes perfect sense that they are drawn to a proposal like the one we're celebrating uh, today and wanting to offer uh, support for it. And I, too, 
Um, are, I'm really excited about this initiative. It's very innovative. It's important. It sends the right message. So Melissa, thank you to you and your team for putting it together. Thank you to all the partners who are here, who are part of making this uh, happen. These things only work if they're partnerships. And they're only, frankly, sustained if they're partnerships. And we're looking forward to seeing this program roll out and sustain over time with the involvement of all of you. I just wanted to make um, a slightly different point because a, a lot of the conversations uh, tend to focus on the benefit to individuals who will now be able to join the workforce uh, and, and participate in what we all strive for, which is a more inclusive society. But I think it's important to emphasize as well what it means for the broader community to have the participation of those individuals. It makes us stronger as a society and a nation when we tap into all the talent that's available to us. And when we leave some people out of the equation, we're not fully realizing that. And you've understood that through your education and advocacy efforts over so many years. And this particular initiative is just another dimension of contributing to the strength, the diversity, the, the, the kind of human infrastructure of our country in a way that can make a tremendous difference. So we all benefit from initiatives like this one. I think it's why we're so excited to, to be here and to be part of this conversation. So again, congratulations to you. Look forward to the conversation. Thank you so much. And if you're in this room, you've been an important partner or perhaps you're a new partner in joining us, a supporter, um, part of our community. And absolutely, this would not have happened without everybody here in this room. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like now to invite everybody to just go around the table. If you would just very briefly give us your name and the organization that you're with, and then we'll move through. My name is Doug DeHaan, and I'm the director at the Hushman Center for Adults with Autism. So Melissa approached myself as well as uh, a Towson University team last summer um, to, or last maybe May, something like that, um, to talk about this and see what we can do to expand it. And we. We at Towson, I can speak, I think, for most of us that we, we value the inclusive nature of what Howard County brings and the program. Um, we work with autistic adults and alongside of them every day. Um, and their conversations are just like the rest of us, you know, like, what do you do for work? Um, like, what's, what's, what's your hobby? You know, so just like all of us, like we find value and importance in what we do for work. And so they deserve that opportunity and we're grateful to be part of that going forward. I'm Melanie Pro, and I'm the interim president at Towson University. Good morning. Paul Pappas, I'm the president of Keith Pappas and Sons. I'm Scott Wolf, former graduate of the hiring program and now executive assistant at Pete Pappas and Sons. I'm Jade Gamerick, I'm Director of Employment and Transition Policy for the Maryland Department of Disabilities. I am Carol Gephardt, I'm the Director of the Institute for Wellbeing at Towson University. Sarah Vanderwerk, Director of Government and Board Relations at WorkSource Montgomery. Kevin Armstrong, Marketing and Training Director at Maryland Works. I'm Teresa Erdman, and along with my husband, we're co-founders of the Husband Center. My name is Kelly Crispin, I'm with the Howard County Autism Society, and I also do the curriculum for the Autism Hiring Program. Good morning, everyone. My name is Hoda Fami, and I'm from UMBC Training Centers. Good morning. I'm Linda Hoyt. I'm the program manager for the Autism Hiring Program. Good morning, everyone. I'm Lady Solano. I'm the contracts manager at WorkSource Montgomery. Good morning. I'm Beth Benavides, associate director of the Husband Foundation and the Husband Institute for Autism. I'm Caitlin Wilson, a uh, department chair at Towson University and the program director for our new Autism Studies PhD. Good morning, I'm Fran Trout, I'm the Director for the County's Office of Workforce Development. Hi everyone, Kim Machineau, Vice President of Public Policy at the Autism Society of America. Patrick Boxall, the past president here at the Hill County Autism Society. Good morning everyone, I'm here representing Dr. Calvin Ball, our County Executive, and I'm Raul Delarme, I am the Deputy Chief Administrative Officer. Christiana Rigby, and I'm the Chair of the County Council and Representative of District 3, where you're here today. 
<laughs> Carol Davey, I'm the secretary for the Maryland Department of Disabilities. Thank you all. Great. Um, I'm going to provide just a little bit of an overview, and I know a lot of you are familiar with the program, but just to give you a little background in case you don't know, um, there are 700,000 um, autistic youth transitioning into adulthood over the next decade. Um, however, as you know, the overall unemployment and underemployment rate begins, you know, remains very high. Um, even for graduates of college, autistic graduates, um, the unemployment rate and underemployment rate can be as high as 85%. So the hiring program that we created advances workplace neurodiversity and acceptance. We connect businesses, we connect skilled autistic adults um, to job seekers, um, help employers find some non-traditional employers that, employees that they may not have um, connected with otherwise. We started in 2021, and um, Patrick Baxel, who is a member of our board, uh, he was there from the beginning. I think, I think we started with a shoestring, and um, thank you to um, our county for providing an, an innovation grant of 10,000 to just really get this off the ground. Um, it's been a, a really uh, exciting time for us. Uh, we were inspired by our, our adult social group who meets here every Saturday, um, and we, we started to hear that they were struggling to find and keep meaningful employment opportunities. Um, so so this, this all kind of launched. Um, we serve autistic adults who have all graduated from high school. Um, many of them have some college, college degrees or advanced degrees. However, they struggle to find and maintain employment. Um, many, many people refer to these folks as in-betweeners. They're not qualified. They're not receiving services or funding from the state, so no DDA, no doors. Um, they're not working with an agency. And because of the way that we have things set up here in Maryland, the order of selection, while they may qualify to receive um, services, they won't get them because they go to the those who have um, the greatest need first. So there's just sort of this pocket of folks who are falling through the cracks, and that's who we who we work with. Um, it's a 10-week program, and as Kelly said, she she um, directs that along with Linda Hoyt. Uh, we have some other folks who work with us um, to get them through a, a curriculum that addresses. Um, you know, any personal challenges, how do we get over that, and also to identify what are your assets, what are you looking for, where do you want to be? And then also cultivating at the same time, and this is just as important, working with the employers, and I know we have some employers in the room today, what can we do to make it work for you? Uh, we provide um, intensive training, neurodiversity in the workforce, we support, and we, we, we maintain contact. So once we connected Scott and Paul, we stay involved. So if there are any bumps in the road, we're there. Um, that also hasn't been happening, I think, in, in, in job connections and where people sort of have, have struggles. There's an ongoing peer support group that happens every month that, that Kelly leads for us. Um, and over this time, since, since 2021, we've had 121 applicants from 11 counties. So. Well, we thought, you know, Howard County, we started to get applications from all these other counties and Baltimore City. Um, of those, and our cohorts run for 10 weeks, as I mentioned, they're small, five or six individuals, sometimes four. We've accepted 39. 36 have completed the program. Um, and we have many folks who have gone from part-time to full-time with full benefits. Um, so, you know, that's just, just you know, been an incredible, um, incredible journey for, for us and for our candidates and for our employers. Um, our employer pipeline has grown to 15 active employers, and that includes folks like Pete Pappas, Northrop Grumman, Defense Intelligence Agency, but also smaller businesses like Clark's Hardware. Um, we've gotten to, to funding from um, Gula Tech Foundation, the Gulas couldn't be here today, but also the Workforce Centers in Howard County, Worksource Montgomery, Maryland Works has been a, a great partner. Um, we just received word that we're getting a grant from the Anne Arundel Workforce Development Corporation as well, so we're looking forward to that. The program is free. That's another difference. We don't charge our candidates, we don't charge our employers. Um, it's all delivered for free. And uh, although we welcome contributions, <laughs> and Kim and I will be biking to the beach on Friday, we're going to be riding to Dewey Beach to raise money for this, and that's, that's how much we believe in it. So 
this this grant, um, this is just unbelievable. And um, sorry, <laughs> new partnership with Tarleton. We're really excited. It's just going to mean, you know, more people that we can help and reach. And so we're very excited to get started with that. And so I'm going to invite Dr. Peralta to say a few words. Our new partnership. And uh, thank you. Well, thanks, Melissa. And, um, it's great to, to hear that you're biking. I will not be biking, <laughs> but that is not a statement of my commitment. Uh, we, of course, are uh, incredibly th thrilled at Towson University to be uh, a part of this collaboration, and uh, we're just uh, very much looking forward to see see where this goes and to extend it outside of you know to the whole state of Maryland and really to be a, a national model. So we're we're very proud to be partnering with Howard County Autism Society for the autism hiring programs expansion of the Hussman Center for Adults with Autism to help advance neurodiversity in, in Maryland's workforce, as we've all been talking about here. And so we're very grateful, of course, to Congressman Sarbanes, Senator Cardin, and Senator Van Hollen for leading this process and for taking the time to come here today to share this announcement, which I think is an amazing tribute to the, the powerful work that people around this room are, are doing, that uh, these gentlemen would take their time to, to join us. We're surrounded so, by so many people, though, who help make this possible. We have state and county elected officials, agency representatives, partner employers, and uh, TU faculty and staff, uh, among others. So I especially want to give a, a bit of a, some kudos to some TU uh, employees and faculty and staff who have really led the effort on our side on this. So uh, Lisa Plotfield, who's the dean of our College of Health Professions, uh, unfortunately she couldn't be here today, but she was a big champion. Uh, for this project and the IWB and the Husband Center uh, as well. Uh, Tad Burek, who's the Associate Dean uh, of College of Health Professions, is here today. Uh, Carol Gebhardt, who is the Director of the Institute of Wellbeing, as well as former IWB Director Sharon Glennon, who actually uh, did a lot of the work sitting in the back. She's sitting in the back, but she did an awful lot of the work behind this uh, on our side uh, and co-funded <laughs> co this. Uh, Doug DeHaan, Director of the Husband Center who's been involved, as we heard, since the very early stages of this. And so we're just very grateful for all the hard work that everybody here has done. So th this, this particular program really embodies many of the ideals that Towson University has as part of our, our mission. It's ensuring an inclusive environment, fostering innovation, and supporting workforce development in our region. So like, it hits all of the areas that Towson University is so proud to be a, a part of. But unfortunately, we know that the majority of adults with autism are unemployed or underemployed. But through this generous funding, TU and the Howard County Autism Society are going to expand workforce diversity and inclusive employment opportunities throughout Maryland. And we're starting with this, uh, this first group, and I believe the target is to get to 45 uh, people as part of this uh, program, which is, we should all consider that a great start, but just a start. And I think really the concept here is proof of concept. And so as we were chatting a little bit uh, earlier this morning that really what TU's part of this is to do the research side of it, the data management and understanding uh, what the metrics are showing and do the analytical side of that. Because we know that that data is what leads to larger and larger programs, right? We need to have that proof of concept so that people see this as something that really is something everybody should be participating in. It's a win-win for employers. It's a win-win for the employees. So uh, it's a great win for the state uh, of Maryland. So as a national leader in autism studies, research, and education, Towson is just uh, really the perfect fit, we think, to be part of this uh, program's continued success. So uh, we're excited to announce that this fall we are launching our PhD program in autism studies. The, First cohort has uh, been recruited, and we're really excited to, to get them in the door. So this is a, um, a very unique uh, program across the country. So it's one of the very few interdisciplinary autism study program uh, in the entire country. And so we uh, look forward to uh, having those students join us, get that research going, and uh, have further collaborations with the important partners around this table. So uh, thank you very much. We're really excited, and I'm excited to, to learn more as we go forward. And I, before we, we get away too, I just want to acknowledge my staff, Suzanne Mason, who's our deputy director, Lisa Kibler, and although she's there, she is. Um, and also the congressional staff. Um, thank you guys so much for making this happen. I've been a lot of interaction the last couple of days. So we really appreciate you. Um, 
we want to turn to our roundtable discussion um, on neurodiversity in Maryland's workplace. And I hope you all kind of maybe just let your imaginations go and let's think about what if is what's possible. And uh, we want to kick that off with um, get a, the perspective of an employer and an employee. And we're going to start with Scott Wolf, who went through a program a couple sessions ago, two sessions ago, I think and is now working full-time with Pete Pappas and Sons in Jessup. So, um, Scott, can you tell us a little bit, just about, just briefly, a little bit about the program and, and what, what that's done for you, what opportunities you had? Sure. Sorry, I'm a little nervous. Not to get yeah. in the same Me too. <laughs> 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 yeah, we're, we're, we're all fair. Fair. We're all yeah. <laughs> okay. um, So, last year was a pretty, pretty rough period in my life. Um, spent months and months unemployed and, uh, you know, came to me that obviously you got some vocational issues that I need to work out. One thing led to another, I met Linda Hoyt and uh, she talked to me about the program and the next, the next window opened up for a cohort. I signed up as soon as I could and um, it was a small group in the, and, um, you know, we all talked about our problems, our individual problems, uh, you know, finding work, um, I guess communicating our skills and our assets to employers and everything. They, uh, Linda and Kelly, we, uh, I guess, over the months and everything, I guess, you know, we each listed our skills and everything, put together personal profiles to put in front of employers. And that really made a difference. And eventually got put in front of King uh, Pops and Sons. I made an impression and became the executive assistant. And I really want to thank you both, Linda and Kelly. You guys have really changed my life. Oh. Um, <laughs> Paul, can you give us a little bit of the perspective of the, um, an employer being part of the program? Sure. Um, first, I just want to say that the uh, Hiring program is awesome. You know, they do an excellent job here. They really set us up for success. I mean, knowing I'm surprised that Scott was unemployed for so long when he came in and interviewed. It was they bring a lot of uh, good opportunities to us. Scott's our third person that we've hired through the, the program, hoping to support it more. Um, I don't understand why other businesses don't take advantage of the opportunity. I think uh, it's important to get the word out there try to uh, speak up the program as much as possible and promote it. Um, Pete Paps and Sons were, you know, the fourth generation company, you know, been in business over 80 years. And, you know, our success is our relationships, you know, taking the opportunities, you know, through hiring, through our customers, through our vendors and everybody. So, um, you know, I can just say that I see a lot of success from this program, from the results that we're seeing and on our end. Um, They've done an excellent job of matching up our needs, coming out and looking at it, and you know that's beyond what you see in a lot of other programs. So uh, I just want to speak out of them and look forward to the future. So, thank you. Thank you so much. So now we kind of want to open it up for discussion. We have three points we want to think about: um, just the value of out-of-the-box solutions, which I think this certainly is the hiring program. Um, how do we engage government, business, disability, community? I would include, you know, schools, all of this, anything you can think of to find solutions and uh, what resources are needed. So, Patrick, you want to kick us off? Well, I, I'm glad to, uh, Melissa. Thank you much. <laughs> and thank you, uh, as, as Senator today, Congressman. We really appreciate the support you're providing. Uh, 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 to this initiative. As Melissa said earlier, I, I was involved kind of at the ground floor and I've been a strong advocate all along to see this, this uh, opportunity grow. I think, uh, I gotta disagree with you though, Melissa. I, I don't agree that this is out of the box, uh, out of the box solution for the following reason. I feel like there's a groundswell in the economy as a whole that employers need to think differently about how they source candidates how they support candidates that come on board. And, and I think that's that's got long-term implications for a lot of different communities, thinking about equity and providing those opportunities. Um, and so 
it may have been out of the box, but I truly feel like there's a change uh, afoot in the economy uh, that's going to really have a strong impact here and in a lot of other communities that have been um, hidden hidden from the workforce. Um, it's, there's a uh, piece of research that I really like to look at, which is called demographic drought. It speaks to kind of the, the overall um, the, the demographic circumstance in the country and that all employers are going to be hungry for talent. And so I think there are some key, key questions that this, this program answers and that others do as well. How do we, how do we make sure that, that the, the hidden workforce is in fact um, uh, connected to the, to the, work, to the workforce? How do, we, how do we work with employers to make sure they're equipped and um, to both recruit and interview and hire and then support employees as they come on board? And then how can we as a community support that effort as a well? whole? And I think this, this program answers all of those questions and I'm really thrilled to see where it is and I think it's a great model that can be applied um, um, in a lot of different circumstances. Um, so that's, that's, you know, I, again, I don't know that it's an absolute. <laughs> that's, that's good. Well, I, I, I think Patrick, where it is an out of the box yeah. solution yeah, is, is it's yeah. it's meeting the gap that the funding limitation have right. So so it's not that it's not that we lack creativity on the placement side, but the, the funding systems are not aligning in a way, and this builds a gap for a need because these folks aren't otherwise eligible, which means that that we have no options. So from that perspective, I think that it really does help but that, that those are where we need to find the solutions right yes i and i agree and i'm i'm looking more futuristically and i'm and I'm, I'm i'm very optimistic that you know that the, the commitment to leave no one behind somebody referenced that uh and to make this sustainable uh, congressman Sarbanes, and, and um, uh, you mentioned that i think those those are all key key elements that we need to take away from this uh this opportunity I'll be here to look at <laughs> Could I ask a quick question of you, Melissa? Sure. Just, you talked about the hidden workforce, and assume that means mostly hidden from employers who could access that workforce, but I would imagine to some degree it's a hidden workforce completely. So how does the Autism Society find the candidates themselves if they aren't coming right. forward to you? Right. What does that look like? Well, you know, that's 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 one of the reasons for this partnership because um, you know we're doing sort of the the first level you know sharing with everybody in the disability community we put it on Facebook groups we share it with our, our young adults um, we put it out wherever we can we put it out through the state um, but pulling in partners like Towson University we're going to reach university students and I know that, that Doug has said you know, they have a, a program for autistic students at Towson, but not every autistic student is part of that program. So will there be an opportunity um, at Towson or at UMBC or at HCC to, to put this out for, for maybe folks who have gone through the academic piece, um, they've graduated, but now they're struggling. And, and that's another reason to create other partnerships um, um, Matt Jackson couldn't be here today, but also talking with Doors, how do we how do we maybe partner there? Um, the WorkSource Montgomery, we were at a, a wonderful roundtable there, um, letting other partners, who other grantees we met, who are working with some autistic candidates, and they're not really sure how to, to do that, so we've connected, Liv has connected with them. Same thing with Maryland Works. Um, so partnerships, partnerships, I think. Sort of yeah. follow up on that. Uh, we had a meeting yesterday in, in Prince George's County Center, Van Holland and I, Clark. And one of the challenges uh, was a language barrier in reaching uh, uh, communities where there's need for services, but they just, we don't have the outreach. Right. There's also the cultural challenges in some yep. communities. Yes. So uh, how do we do a better job in reaching the challenging communities because of their underserved status 
uh, so that they can get the services that they need for employment. And, and I'll please everybody chime in, but we we are very mindful of that. We have a, a Latino parent support group that's 100 families strong, and we just hired um, Spanish language resource coordinator. There are other partnerships in the state because this is a big, and, and Senator, Secretary Beatty, we were just at a, an event um, and I was connected with Lisa Lorraine yesterday through Jubilee about reaching out and building um, an advocacy and awareness and resources for the Latino community. But there are others, um, Korean and, and other, because autism um, and disabilities are in every community and we need those resources. So um, others can. Secretary Beatty, I'm sure you're, I know you're seeing that and hearing that. I would turn it over to my colleague, Jade. She's Jade. been doing excellent work <laughs> in this area, but it just is opening up the, the box, you know. And yeah, I think that um, one of the things that the Moore administration has really helped us to hone in on is the fact that, particularly from a government perspective, we expect people to come to us. Um, and that's not an effective model for the populations who need these services the most. And certainly that's something I headed up one of the research grants promoting the readiness of minors on supplemental security income. And that's what we found is the perception, right, when we started down that, that pathway was that folks don't want to work, they don't want these services. That's not what we found. We had an over 85% um, engagement rate. Um, they want it. Our system structures don't meet them where they are. And we need to do a better job of going out and finding them and also creating spaces that make them feel want wanted, make them feel welcome. Um, I think that you know, coming in the door through, through the Autism Society lets them know that they're going to be supported and valued and so forth, as opposed to maybe going in a door where they're a little more nervous about self-disclosing. Um, building relationships with the Hispanic community. Lisa Lorraine has done a fantastic job, and Enrique Viendos, um, or Enrique Benitos Vidas. Yes. Yeah, I'm working on that. <laughs> but that's a coalition of uh, 26 and growing Hispanic organizations, um, the Asian American population, and recognizing the cultural differences um, and how we can do a better job of meeting their needs, meeting them where they are, and seeking them out and being proactive and not reactive. I'm curious on the employer side, how much resistance you receive in having employers out there to hire some from the program. You know, I think we make the generalization. Some businesses will say, I tried that, it didn't work. You know, but that would be like saying I hired a tall person and I'm never hiring a tall person again. I mean, like, you know, you can't make those global generalizations and I think it's really helping them understand and like Melissa mentioned, providing that education piece to understand that there's unique skills and sometimes we work to overcome the challenges to get to the base of those skills. So are you, do you get a lot of that answer when you knock on doors that they tried it or they don't oh, have yeah, the Oh yeah, we've done that before, yeah. Or, you know, I'm not sure, we don't have the manpower, we're short staff, it's gonna be really labor intensive for us. I think businesses are thinking it's going to require a great deal of effort on their part. And you probably can speak to that, you know, as much as I can. Sometimes it's having a champion that employer um, we've had that situation and that's been the case you all have a family member um, North of Grumman DIA there you know um, my husband hired one of our graduates so and we have a nephew with autism I, sometimes it takes a champion on the inside to get that you know to open that door that can be super helpful um, but you know that's not always going to be the case. and I think starting with one like you did and, and we try to meet the employer wherever they are if it's a part-time contractual start, if it's just an hourly um, by-the-job assignment, let them experience the success and grow from there. There's no pressure that you have to come in and hire somebody you know, full-time benefit. If, if you have apprehensions, let's work at your speed to make this happen, and that's what we really try to do. So how do we get the message out there to the employers? And how can we help ourselves at PFAPs and Sons to help get the message out and to let employers know? I know on the small business side, it is a challenge. You're trying to get your daily work done, you know, and you think that I'm struggling just to do this, and now I'm going to have to go outside my comfort zone and hire somebody in an area I'm not used to. But giving them the assurance that this program does an excellent job setting them up for success, you know, and there's a lot of benefits to having somebody 
that's diverse in their thought process and how they work. That everybody has their different strengths and you know bring more success to an organization. So. Where's Jennifer? We have Jennifer from HCC. Uh -oh. oh, I'm so sorry. Please come join us because just if you can just talk. Come on. Um, Howard Community College um, um, has been a wonderful partner and one of the programs that we've been looking at with them and with other partners um, in Carroll County and Frederick County is this healthcare alliance. Do you want to just, that's okay, here you are. Do you want to just give a like, just a little, you know, overview of a, one of those efforts because that's really bringing in partners in an intentional way in partnership with the college. Um, with Howard Community College, we've been working on initiatives in the healthcare arena. One would be um, sort of a career pathway from patient transport to CNA, or um, I forget the term that they use, is a technician that stocks the supply rooms and moving that to a sterile processing. So we see that as a career pathway that's doable. Um, and we had the roundtable discussions, Jade, you can maybe talk about that at a higher level, with um, several uh, local Howard County healthcare partners. And I developed some curriculums. Um, I'm not sure if you saw them yet, Melissa. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so um, some just basic outlines and how that career your pathway might work. So I'm ready. Howard Community College would love to know more about the Towson program. Maybe collaborate. Yeah. yeah, so you know, I think with the 2% unemployment rate that Maryland's at, which on the one hand is cause for celebration, right? But on the other hand, is having significant implications um, across all aspects. Um, so it's an opportunity in the partnership with the uh, community colleges is how are we identifying the skills that are necessary and how can we create credentials with a little c, not the big c, um, but that still would qualify for the WIOA funding because that's where our system sometimes creates some unintended barriers in terms of funding and eligibility that align with businesses' needs so that then we're creating that pipeline of candidates um, at a time when business needs it the most. And then there is that education and awareness piece that I think is really critical. And I think that Northrop Grumman in particular, when they started to have these conversations, the support from their existing workforce, I think they were stunned by. We were doing online presentations because it started during the pandemic and there were people anonymous anonymously posting in the chat saying, I feel seen, I feel valued as an employee, that they're making this investment in neurodiversity. You know, um, I'm a family member. Um, and so I think that the more that we talk about it and the more that we share the successes um, and, and that it's aligned with supports, right? Because I think that where business struggles is the feeling if they've had a negative experience, it could be left on their own. And that's where that support is so critical. Linda does a phenomenal job um, in ensuring that they're not going to be left hanging. That that you know, if if if, if uh, Mr. Pappas has a problem, he's got someone to call. Whether or not Linda's getting paid by VR or by the WIOA, she's going to be there to answer the phone and help him meet his needs long term, regardless of the funding structure. And I think that's what really business wants and needs is to ensure that hey. I've got a resource to turn to if I have a question or a problem. Even if one of his other employees would, were to come forward and say, you know what, I know you didn't hire me for the autism program, but I have autism, um, you know, it's gonna enhance his capacity to provide accommodations. Northrop Grumman is actually paying out of their business line items to provide job coaching supports to some of their workforce. And I think that that's where long term we need to go, right? We need for business to see that there's an inherent value in my continuing to pay for some of these supports as, a, as an accommodation in the same way that I build a ramp or, you know, I make my website accessible. Yeah. So I just want to say that I think like really where we need to go if we want to make this sustainable and replicable and, and broaden it out is we really need to harness all areas of so we have the government contribution business of course education uh generous philanthropists like teresa urban uh and her family 
that it bring all of this to bear to this uh, this issue. I think that's what we're gonna. The rising tide is gonna lift all, all boats, and uh, really, I think business is gonna see it's in your it's in their self interest, right? That this, there's so much talent uh, out there and incredible contributions that are sitting there just waiting to be tapped. And so this is a this is an important community that is uh, is ready to go and uh, having the support, just that full wraparound service, I think, is gonna be really transformational. That's great. Thank you, and, and um, Hoda, um, the UMBC Training Center is a new partner uh, through a grant from the Blue Tech Foundation to bring more newer diversity to the cyber and IT, and we just started our first candidate with you, and so we're able to pay for some certification training um, with some extra supports for a candidate, and he's also joining the, am I correct, he's joining the apprenticeship program at HCC. So these are opportunities where we can also, you know, kind of pay for some of the training, the certifications, yes? Yeah, so um, at UMBC we do, uh, you know, we welcome all, you know, anyone who is interested in, in our programs and we give them the training and the accommodations that are needed for them. Um, yes, we just started a new student, we're very excited about it and we're looking forward to, you know, enrolling more students who are interested in our programs and providing them those correct accommodations to get them to improve their professional lives. Can you talk about, in terms of the first, what is it, 30, 36 have finished the yeah. program? Yeah. Um, do many of them require some kind of certification in the skill, you know, that they're, for the jobs, or are they, or these broader based sort of positions? Linda, we have we have some engineering students. We have yeah, you know, yeah. People are working in a wide array of areas. So really, I think that's the other piece to mention is really looking at the needs of the business and the skill sets and interests of the individual. Um, and if they're interested in something, looking at is that you know something that um, that they are interested in, and what are the reasonings behind that, so that it can support and grow. And those roles vary from retail based to um, professional engineering. So she said, we have a couple working at the Defense Intelligence Agency and IT roles. A second one is starting in the next week after a year long onboarding <laughs> process of clearances. And yes. So, we <laughs> 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 right. were right. saying that right. um, this population typically has no problem passing any of the clearance and background checks. So, that's a real <laughs> asset. There's not any skeletons to be uncovered as they go through that process, but it's lengthy. It's like the and, and where we've been able to help is just sort of navigating like a polygraph test or you know just kind of getting through that the, just the different levels. So. You know, I really I think a lot of it is just that it's a lot of assumptions on what you do for another employee may not be the same and it's, and they may not have the foresight to ask those questions. So I just assist them in that capacity. Can you tell me where is it that they need to park? Where, what door will they be entering? Who will it be that they're asking for and kind of getting more information from the business ahead of that first meeting so that it is successful and they're not arriving later collaborating but they're taking on the onus of that work and the skills that they're learning in the hiring program are setting them up to continue to use those skills and again our theme our theme lately has just been telling telling sharing with employers you know you you make the accommodations in order to get to the strengths. Yeah. That's really what this is about. Um, could, I, could I just add that the Autism Society of America is um, looking at this program and its success, and we are we just started um, an employment program, and we are trying to educate an employers, um, and we want to lift this up and replicate these types of, of successful programs across the country. And I, and I would like to uh, thank Senator Cardin. I don't know if you know this, but Mike Thomas in your office has uh, been very generous in helping, trying to help us find some funding. Um, not, we haven't found it yet, but uh, to help us replicate these types of programs across the, the country. And he's also been generous with this time to come and speak to our affiliates about uh, how to apply for earmarks. So I wanted to thank you for that and to say that we are trying to make sure this is going on across the country through our 70 affiliates. Thanks, Kim. Um, we need to do some, are we good on time? We need to do some wrap up or I'm looking at Bridget. <laughs> <laughs> Melissa, can I get a picture? Okay. Um, I just want to add another dimension because I know we've got a couple of our workforce board partners here at the table. Yeah. And I wanted to uh, 
to thank them for their support, first off. But I think that we see this as an integral, the initiative that we have as being a really integrated part of what the blueprint system looks like as a whole. And here in Maryland, we know the blueprint for Maryland is underway, and the workforce schools have got a growing role related to um, um, career preparation inside the K through 12 system. And I think back to the point earlier or question earlier about how do you connect uh, connect with um, candidates to come through this kind of initiative and I think that can be an important part of this that can be an important part of this really focusing in on what career pro preparation looks like through K through 12 can really uh, be a launch pad to to what's happening um, outside that system as well so I want to thank WorkSource Montgomery and the Howe County uh, Department of uh, Absolutely. 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 Could I just yes. add real quickly, um, another partner, another opportunity to look at, um, obviously our governor is a very interested in service and people experiencing service, he often says it's sticky, you know, and I, I, I believe that having spent my whole life um, in public service. And we have created, the, the governor's created um, a cabinet level department on, um, public, on service and civic innovation. We have a brand new secretary, uh, Paul Montero, uh, and he, they are, as we speak, working on rolling out a public service option for high school students as they leave um, to experience a year paid of um, public service, some type of public service. And I wanna make sure that our students with disabilities are um, included in, in that opportunity. And we've had lots of conversations with the, with the secretary and his staff, and they're very open. The governor is very supportive of this. So a link maybe that we can make to that program for our high school students who are not really s certain what they're gonna be doing next, but they can get that experience um, and that support. And that link will be coming out very shortly. We would actively encourage, we're still in discussions about would an individual have the option of self-disclosing because we wanna make certain that, that we know that we have students with disabilities. And it will be for um, recent graduates from 2021 or 22. Um, so, so stay tuned, I'll be pushing that out to Melissa. Oh, Melissa will be getting that out to folks as well. So. That's wonderful. Well, um, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I think uh, it's time for us to give you a Yes. Closing. <laughs> um, no, we don't want to leave without giving you a check. <laughs> we'll take it. Uh, speaking from the three of us for one moment, and that is uh, you thanked us for being here. We thank you. Uh, there are some days that we wonder what we're doing makes a difference. And when we see, Scott, your example, it puts a face on the issues and we know we are making progress and we know there are gaps and you're absolutely right we all have to fill those gaps we need help in corporate america filling those gaps we have generous individuals that are helping to fill the gap and government needs to do a more effective job of filling the gaps so we think today we are going to fill a little bit of that gap but we recognize there's a lot more we all need to do so we're just, uh, you motivate us, and we just want you to know that. We're very proud to represent you. Thank you. Thank you so much. No, I would, let me just say amen to that, because uh, <laughs> I know we want to get to the presentation. But um, as I think we all said, we were really proud to fight for these resources, but we're especially proud of all of you because you're taking the resources uh, and converting it uh, into real progress uh, and, and inclusion. So uh, thank, thank all of you. and look forward to continuing to work with you and both at the state county state and, and federal level and all you around the table so thank you and, and congressman sarbanes really arranged this meeting we thank him very much he's been our leader in, in, in this part of the state and as senator sarbanes said as senator uh, van holland said uh he's been a national leader uh, on so many issues thanks senator uh, van holland senator cardin and thank you and all of you here for giving us the benefit of your perspective. One of the things that uh, humans do that constrain our ability to be kind of collectively creative is we have this fear of the unknown, 
that operates on us. And um, sometimes that can be an explanation for not reaching the next level, but it can't be an excuse. And what you're doing, all of you collectively, is helping overcome that fear of the unknown and let people know uh, what the opportunities are to fully realize their potential as employers to reach out and be more inclusive. So it's tremendously exciting and we're glad to be able to support it as, as we are.